Hello, I am Peter, and join me to... Hello, it's me, Peter. Please edit that out, Buzz. Yo. <laughs> well, hello. Us. Uh, f*** it. Uh. Mm. Yeah. Third Degree, the podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. Now, Soccer90.com is your source for all your FC Dallas national team and international club gear. You know that. Did you know, though, they actually have new arrivals that include the new PSG third jersey. Heading into this weekend, it's the Hall of Fame thing, it's the FC Dallas Mass, it's even the Willie Nelson concert. If you go, you need to know that the store itself will be open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's right next door to the Hall of Fame facing Main Street, so stop by, go check it all out in person, and grab your gear before the match. And all Third Degree listeners, you know this, you receive 25% off your order when you use the code Third Degree at checkout over at Soccer90.com. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Winless in September are the good guys. But after two games of Marco, it has a look and a feel a lot like two games of Lucci. We'll talk all about that in episode 130 of Third Degree, the podcast. Hello, it's me, Peter, and joining me today is not Dan Crook, who apparently is traversing the country looking for the fugitive Brian Laundry, But I do have your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, the good Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz. Hi, Peter. How are you? Um, I'm okay. I had a crown fall out of my mouth eating dinner last night, and I had to have that put back on today. So that would pretty much tell you how my day went. Yeah, for a second there, I had a visual metaphor of an entire crown coming out of your mouth. But um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to hear about your crown. Yes, I know what you mean by it can make for a difficult day. That happened before I started watching the FC Dallas Kansas City game in delay, where I fell asleep and uh, didn't get to watch the second half till today. Mm. Well, yes, I, I, I doubt that the, the FC Dallas Kansas City game served as anything but perhaps a painkiller, a number. <laughs> mentally anyway <laughs> it put me right to sleep yeah S- i slept like a baby okay buzz since we last spoke we got our first two do- doses of marco Ferruzzi as coach and they both turned out to be pretty crappy results a 1-0 loss in vancouver and then last night's uh 3-1 loss at home to kansas city uh and i think my big takeaway buzz is what i said earlier in this i don't know what it means when those two games certainly and felt and looked a lot like just it's almost as if lucci never left yeah the the differences under marco are minor uh and before i say what a couple of those are i will repeat what i always say which is that this is clear evidence of the fact that coaching in soccer the head coach in soccer once the game starts has the least impact on any sport, right? The most impact for a soccer club, and it comes through the building of the roster. And that's a combination of the technical director and the coach putting all the pieces together. Coach says, here's what I need. TD goes and gets it for him. I've used the example example many times about the amount of money Klopp has spent since he arrived at Liverpool. He didn't coach up the 40 dudes they had. He changed the 40 dudes they had. So in this case, with eight games left when Marco took over, he cannot change the roster at all. He has to try and play with what he has. Dallas, this year, we've talked about it many times, has a lopsided roster that actually has multiple holes in it. It even has six or seven dead positions on it, that well, players that are either gone or holes that are in the roster, like literal, actual, vacant roster holes. So he's very limited in his ability to do anything. There's no extra guys around that aren't playing, except for maybe Andres or Carte, which now two coaches in a row don't use for some reason. So that's the gigantic takeaway. It's like you cannot fundamentally alter this team overnight. You have to try and do things and adapt what was already here. And that includes the tactics. You can't bring in a whole new tactical system overnight. You have to take the one that's here and tweak it. So the tweaks are, from watching these two games, a little bit of a more tight block in terms of uh, the back line to the midfield, a little bit of a more 
vertical. They still build from the back, but there's a little bit more of a more directness to it. Occasionally, you get a little bit of an Oscar Perea type aggressive forward, but not as much as you would when Oscar was actually here. So, and then there's some attempts at some mentality, you know, that you hear from them talking about focus and one game at a time and stuff, but no dramatic changes. I mean, it's basically impossible to completely dramatically change a group when you only have about 23 guys to work with. I think the the thing that was a bit surprising, though, was the fact that he did make some... Uh, well, we can just start with the, the Vancouver game, the decision to take Defari off, Defari off uh, and put on Brisson and Hedges, uh, which clearly didn't turn into anything great. I still think Defari is the best center back on the team, and I'm confused as to why he's the one that's been reduced in, in, under Feruzzi. Um, out, out of all of this, but also the addition of Brian Acosta and Quinone. The, uh, uh, I guess my overall view is is the big change to me is the clear direction of moving towards veteran players and away from some of the younger guys in key positions. Yeah, uh, when you're talking about the defensive leakages that had been happening, it wasn't surprising to me. And effectively, that's what they were claiming Lucci got fired for. They're, they're going to fix the defense, right? That was all the talk. You remember that press conference? Well, yeah. Hedges, Hogginson was still out, right? So you didn't have him. Uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't surprise me when a new coach comes in that he leans hard veteran right away. Because if you're talking about man management of a locker room, you know, you probably have had some veterans that have been saying, man, how come I'm not playing? Okay, I'm in. Let's go. Here's your game. Show me you should have been playing. You know, also there were three games in a week, maybe a little bit of rotation happening there. You know, so it didn't shock me at all, actually, that that game he leaned heavy veteran at all. I mean, I was kind of expecting him to do that defensively. What did shock me is that he went with Che on the right and Tuomasi on the left. I thought for sure that he would go with Tuomasi on the right, you know, with with, uh, Martinez, because we've seen Martinez slot in at left before. And he did later in that game, he came in on the left as a left back. And I even wondered if he would go with like a Brisson or a Tafari at right back, two guys we've seen at right back, and go really heavy into like these veteran, pure defender type of defenders and try and clean up the thing and, and put Nacosta and Quinone in with those defensive center backs, or sorry, those veteran center backs. None of that surprised me. It was actually that he didn't, I thought he was going to go further. So um, some of it was rotation, some of it, but most of it is just, I've been here a long time. I trust these guys. I've seen them play for three years now, four years now. Some of them had just 10 years now. Not surprising he went to those guys. All right. So in complete honesty, I watched the Vancouver game late Saturday night. I did not fall asleep during it, although I wanted to. I don't really remember anything about this game, to be honest with you. Well... other yeah. than the fact that it was really boring and the team didn't play well, and that and that again, it just felt like a Lucci performance in in yeah. some different way. It, well, actually, the, they actually played okay in that game. I mean, consider that it was on the road, right? It's in Canada. We know how on hard turf. Is, yeah, on turf. How hard is it to play in MLS? If you look at the stats, yeah, they right, outshot them in yeah. terms of on goal and they had shots more on possession, goal, yeah. more possession. Yeah, I mean they had more. I think it was duels they won more of. It's not. It wasn't a horrible game. It wasn't a interesting game or fascinating game or fun game. <laughs> but you know, a lot of the things were there. They got un- unlucky, I think, with the one goal they gave up. Um, you know, it didn't. I didn't. I didn't watch that game and then go, man, that. They got rocked. I mean, it felt like they were pretty even in that game, which is not surprising because Vancouver's not very good either. They're better than Dallas, but just barely, you mm-hmm. know. So it kind of was, you know, it, it's what people that believe in promotion and relegation would point at as like a, here's a crap end of season MLS game between two crap teams and no one's playing for anything because nobody cares. I mean, it had that vibe about it, right? So, you know, that that's what it was. It was two teams that are not that claim that they're fighting for a playoff spot, but other than the Vancouver having two games in hand, they're not really fighting for it, really. I mean, you know. <laughs> so that's I mean that, that's a whole different discussion we can have at some point about the disingenuousness of this idea that Dallas was fighting for a playoff spot with eight games left. But um yeah, just kind of a game. You know, people just sort of played in it, you know, nobody really that I remember had I mean, I don't I think Justin Shea got roasted pretty good, but other than that um, yeah, he had a, he struggled. Yeah. The, I think the thing now that I think about it, I'm just trying to 
go back in my mind. The other thing that I now remember thinking is, wow, this is weird because typically when you get a team playing its first game after a coach has been shit canned, you tend to get a little boost, right? Like the big, the, yeah. the new, the new manager boost. And man, we didn't see any of that. Um, and and uh, at least from my opinion, I didn't. I didn't feel like the team looked like it was fighting extra hard to kind of reprove itself in any way. Um, and I thought that was a little surprise. I, when you when you balance that with the performance last night against Kansas City, I, I guess what I'm saying is I just have this weird vibe that the collective roster has just realized how the rest of the season is yeah. going to go. They, they don't really have a shot at it. And I'm not saying they've quit. I'm just saying they've just not put out 100% probably most of the time. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, it looks like a team that knows where they are. Here's the thing. like A lot of times you get that coach bounce, and it's a legit real thing. When – the coaches lost the locker room. Uh, and there's a, there was always a weirdness with Lucci in the sense that he is super likable. And I think everybody likes him. I think that in terms of this season, there was a tune out problem because after a while, you've heard it all from Lucci a million times and he is very long winded. And a lot of the young kids and a lot of the veterans, I think, had tuned out. That's not quite the same as like them disliking him. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. I think a little bit of the lack of coach bounce is because there wasn't like a, oh, thank God, screw that guy. It, it was just kind of like, oh, okay, okay, let's try something new, you know? And so it is what it is. You know, and, and Marco doesn't exactly have ultimate cachet in the terms of like, I'm the guy, you better play for me. I mean, he's interim, and they flat out said he's coaching for his job. So it's like, there's no incentive for these guys to bleed for Marco. Even if they've known him for years, they're still not like, I'm not going to go put my body on the sword for you necessarily. So I, you get a flatness. I'm not. It's no surprise at all. There's a flatness. Well, then they have the game. I mean, I, is there anything else about the Vancouver game you want to discuss? I don't uh, feel like there's much to. You know, you, you had the Acosta back in, which I thought was something they should do, and he was just kind of in the game. You know, and Kenyon was in there, and he was just kind of in the game. I mean, the, the only thing I really like lately, the last couple of games, is Emma Tuomasi. <laughs> frankly, <laughs> I, I can say it's not. Hold on, I, I keep getting roasted for this, Ema. Tumasi, I keep getting it wrong because I'm, you know, stupid gringo, but um, he could deserve some credit because even on the left side, I think he's been terrific. You know, he's not a lefty, but he's played enough left at, at wake that it's not a terrible adjustment. Uh, and the last several games, not just this one against Vancouver, but the last several, I think he's been really nice. It's a shame that he had, wasn't available for the beginning of the season. You know, another component that was missing at the start of the year that hurt Lucci. So it it was overall a not a great performance in Vancouver, and it certainly didn't set a good tone or a hopeful tone for Marco, who you know, according to Dan, is playing for his future, with the exception that if he just screws it up, he gets to go back to his old job. So he's not really playing for anything. Yeah. Um, and then they have this game last night against Kansas City, and you were the one that made me aware. I had no idea that last night from an off the field standpoint was a, they wedged in the front office wedged in two nights of celebration. Like it was two theme nights. It wasn't just kick children's cancer in the ass night. It was also Hispanic heritage night. Yeah. And I didn't get any of that. I got, I remember the one thing where they showed the ball and they said, and then Mark and Steve talked about cancer for, something for a second like that's in the back of my head but i don't remember anything about hispanic heritage night yeah. and the idea that fc dallas's front office wedged those two things into one night just as the most fc dallas thing ever the only reason i knew about it was because it was in the notes um that they mentioned both of them and the, and I, I didn't i put them i put both of them into my little game info thing i do my little post where i do my <laughs> lineup thing i mentioned them both in there because they were in the notes and they were in the little media uh, five things they send out to media um and they it mentioned something like there was a couple of bands or something and 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 then the cancer they mentioned there was going to be that stuff at halftime or whatever all that stuff they did you know most of that doesn't end up in the broadcast um which i had to watch too because i also wasn't there but uh, you know, they only had that one other home game, which was the 9-11 game. So maybe they didn't feel like they wanted to sandwich both of the, one of those things into the 9-11 game. Well, they then were too like, busy celebrating the death of 3,000 people by selling tickets yeah. for $9.11, Buzz. Yeah, well, maybe that's what the first time they... priorities, sir? Right. Maybe that's the first time they read the room and realized we shouldn't do kick childhood cancer or the Hispanic Heritage Night on 9-11 Remembrance Night. 
didn't bother to stop the ticket promo, but at least didn't do those two things. So, I mean, I don't know when else you're going to get him in. I listen it. FC Dallas does not do a great job with Hispanic characters night, which is a shame in this market. You know, I'm sure they did some stuff. I didn't see it. I'm not going to complain too much about it because I did not see it, but it's not like they made a big deal about it with like a bunch of, they finally put out a video actually on Twitter. They had a really nice video with like players in front of their national flags of their, their heritage, whether they're Mexican American or Colombian American or whatever, or actually for the countries they're from. That was a really nice little video. It's a shame there wasn't, more of that kind of thing, like in the broadcast, perhaps, or, uh, you know, visible on the field, like the, the kick, kick childhood cancer kid stuff was, you know, just overall, just they trying to get two of those things in one game just didn't really work. It is weird to me because it, it, it does smell like the other if it smells like one of those things the league forces the clubs to do like Oh for sure. When they have to when the when the, when clubs individually on their own social media account have to promote other clubs' games like in the playoff or whatever. Yes, yeah. And you know how much all the clubs hate doing that. And they all kind of <laughs> half heartedly do it or they make a joke about doing it. That's yeah. how kick childhood cancer in the ass and uh, heritage Hispanic night. Uh, yep. wedged into one Wednesday night, 7 p.m. on a school night uh, scheduling went for, for Dallas this year. Yeah, I will I will give them a tiny escape in the fact that they had all these road games in the month. There was that caveat, but nonetheless, it was just like, you know, okay. Uh, so the game itself uh, was really weird because, you know, as a guy in the media, you wait for the lineups to come out. And you see the graphic that the social media dude puts out, and it's the it's the same typical four two three one lineup with yeah. a, a couple of person personnel changes, but immediately I see Steve Davis quote tweet the image and talk about how Marco has decided to mimic the formation used against Kansas City in the prior game, I think by Seattle, uh, with a more of a three four. Uh, one two lineup and the graphic was weird and then I thought oh no oh no Marco don't play three in the back <laughs> this yeah. team sucks with three in the back and lo and behold we got what we got in the first 45 minutes of that game yeah the the funny thing first let me explain the disconnect with the the broadcast and the, the social media um, I mentioned before with Marco, he plays his cards really tight, really close to the vest. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that the social media guys get the lineup from the coach. I know that Lucci used to draw it for him. Cause I remember like when the first time we'd said it was a four, four, one, one, I was like, yeah. where did that come from? Well, that was, no, no, that was clearly from Lucci saying that's what it was. So in this case, my assumption, knowing Marco, like I do is that he didn't give them the shape. He just gave them a list of names. And they just assumed Ryan was left back or left wing when they're trying to figure out how come Martinez is in there. Easy mistake to make. Now, Steve Davis, being the broadcast guy, more than likely, because he's an employee of the team, he can go to training late in the week. They usually go to training on a Friday, watch a little bit of the walkthrough, sit down with the coach, have a little session, talk about what the tactics are. So when they go on the air, they can explain it to the fans. So Davis... I don't know if he actually went to training on Friday, but more than likely his version of that being a three, five, two came directly from Marco in the sense of like, once you're on the air, I'm willing to let you talk about it. And that's how tight Marco plays stuff. He does not want to talk about tactics ever. So that would have been probably Monday or Tuesday, not Friday. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of a Saturday game, right? Yeah. yeah it would okay. have been Tuesday for the Wednesday game, Friday for a Saturday game. Same thing. Like the walkthrough day, the day that no, the normal media are not allowed to go. I used to be allowed to go to that like a decade ago. And I actually on purpose chose to quit going on Friday because nothing happens but that. So that's like, there's nothing to talk about except what the lineup is. And then they're mad at you. So I, that's why I go like on Wednesday, but um, that's how you get that disconnect. But the three at the back thing, I, I get the idea um, when you have Hollingshead back and you're trying to get, you're trying to solidify the defense a little bit. When you have three at the back, you can you can sit back into five. You know that as well as anything as anybody, you know. And then you can still get forward. The problem for me with this formation and this particular team, when you play three five two, which is what it is basically, you don't have any wings. Hollingshead and Tuomasi. From that deep, they can get forward, but it's not the same as having an actual winger width up front next to Pepe. Because when Pepe's on an island, everybody just boxes Pepe. They put two center backs in front of him and two behind him and two sixes in front of him, and then he can't get the ball. And so that's basically what happens 
for the first half of the game, right? It's clear as obvious. But, you know, but Jesus is trying to get in there. But, it's but like, isn't that supposed to be solved by the fact that you've got o- Obreon near him as a, as a dual striker in that formation? Theoretically, yes. <laughs> but it also should be helped solved by Jesus jumping forward. But then the problem with if Jesus jumps forward, then you're shorthanded in the central midfield again, particularly when Acosta is doing this whole go back to the back line and try and build forward stuff, which he did about half the time and left Kenyon on the island by himself in midfield. You know, if, if Obreon was a better, legit second striker, you know, where he's making runs in and off of Pepe like he should, he, he too often he just sort of sat on that one right stagnant channel and all they did was pinch in there right back and then they had him in a box too. Yeah. Well, the other part was, and, and Steve and Mark talked about this in the broadcast, is that Jesus was like hiding out wide a lot and 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 there were a lot of times where the midfield was just getting run over left and right because it just was a well the whole thing was just a mess they looked like they had never played the formation before yeah, ever. yeah. Acosta kept coming back trying to pick up the ball from the center backs and build forward like from back there because both Hollingshead and Tuomasi are getting up high like they should so he's trying to go back and help abandons the midfield Jesus is looking for the ball so he's moving away from uh, their sixes trying to get into space because they're, they're, they're compacting the middle because of Pepe and because of Jesus, they're compressing the middle. So he's looking for space. He's looking for the ball. So he's moving out of there and you're, you're left with just one central midfielder, Faco, who's a relatively immobile uh, in the sense of like build forward. He's not going to quick check and turn and quick move. It's all pretty, uh, you know, middling in that sense from him. So it leaves you completely snookered in the middle of the park and so for 45 minutes you just saw dallas like how do we get forward they just like they couldn't figure it out for a lot of it and so jesus finally started coming inside some and acosta's finally started going back up some and they were also able to play a tiny bit over the top to pepe although he was offside on the when he scored so it, it wasn't yeah. great no, it drives me nuts because, and and you know, everybody listening to this knows how much you and I revere and love Oscar, but even when Oscar would occasionally make the decision to play three in the back, as much as that would make sense in terms of the, the personnel that he had, it just never worked. And then from Oscar into Lucci and now into Feruzzi, it's, I can't, has there ever been a game for Dallas where playing a three-man back line has worked out well for them? I can't remember one. And then what you get as a fan is you're like, why are they doing this? This never works. And then they make the change back to a four, you know, to two center backs. And suddenly yeah. the team, the team just looks so dramatically different and improved. You're like, why did you ever do it in the first place? And that's maddening as a fan. I, I think to be good in a three, in my opinion, to be good in a three, you have to practice it and play it all the time. The last coach that did that was there were a couple seasons where Durr played a three, three, yeah. five, two, like the whole year, you know, and you had that Eck uh, uh, Zarco combo or the uh, maybe it was Eck Deering combo for a little while, you know, then it can kind of go, but you have to do it all the time. And it takes, that takes the right kind of wing back. Like you can't just stick anybody out on wing back. You can't stick Shun out there. You can't stick Paxton out there. Even Ryan doesn't really have it. It takes uh, a level of work rate and end to end like Kobe Jones had it, right? If you want to go way back because you have to be able to be a fifth outside back and you have to be able to be a third wing, both. And then, and also a fifth midfielder. You have to do all three of those jobs. That's the whole point of that formation is that one guy does the whole thing. So there are modern guys that can do that. I don't know that Tuomasi is that guy, and I don't know that Hollingshead is that guy. I don't think they have those guys on this roster. So trying well, to do it on this es- roster doesn't work. Especially Ryan coming off an, in- an extended yeah. injury amount of times that he missed. Like I mean, Ryan was clearly rusty last night. He hadn't played, what, three games in a row, four games in a row? Yeah. Uh, it just seemed like a really weird decision. And, I, for, and if Feruzzi really is coaching for this job – it absolutely screwed with my – it just made a mess of me trying to figure out how seriously he really thinks he has an opportunity to win this job. Because, you know, as as a fan of this club and a guy that does this podcast and the radio show, my day-to-day uh, thinking when I'm not doing my real work uh, is, yeah. is really trying to suss out what's going to happen with who they're going to hire for this job. And we talked about this on the last podcast. I constantly am battling internally with myself over they're going to do the hunt thing and they're going to hire Eric Quill or Marco Ferruzzi or the whole Zanata thing. And they're going to let Zanata hire a guy. And 
after the last two games, I'm now starting to lean more towards the Zanata end of the meter because I think Marco just doesn't really care very much because he knows he's not getting the job and he's just trying shit just to try it. Well, I, he definitely cares. The guy's super competitive, even if he's not demonstrative. He, um, I, I think, I think the last part you hit there is the key. I think he's searching for answers. I think clearly they've told him it's about fixing the defense. Show us that you can fix the defense. Because all these things he's trying, to me, look like attempts to solidify. Obviously, against Kansas City, it didn't work when you get three goals scored on you again. So quickly, he recognizes over the first half, it ain't working. And then at second at halftime, they fix it and go back to the other way. You know, I, I'm not Until saying... Until Brisson gets toasted. Yeah. I mean, Brisson getting toasted is a completely different thing. Uh, listen, <laughs> I was just talking to somebody a little while ago, and I was like, it's going to be so hard for me to not start talking about next season till November. You know, because, you know, we had to do content at the appropriate time. So, like, next season stuff is going to okay. be November, not yeah, now. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. If we're going to talk about Ferruzzi as a coach, I yeah. have to legitimately question why you would leave Brisson on the field and take mm. Tafari off at halftime. I mean, Brisson was responsible directly for two goals um, uh, in that the, yeah. the, the one where he got toasted by Salawi and the second one where he just fell over and pretended like he hurt his shoulder again and left Acosta to foul the guy. Like, if he had just tackled that ball, none of that stuff happens. Yeah. I Clearly, to me, that says that uh, Verusi doesn't trust Tafari. Or they know that they can have Tafari long-term, and they have to try and figure out between Brasson, Martinez, and Hedges who's not coming back. Okay, but hold on. Before you move on there, I want to ask a question. Yeah. Am I, am I being a simpleton fan slash media wonk when I say Tafari is the best center back on this team currently, at least in the, his performances from game to game, week to week? Or is there something about Tafari's game that I'm not n nuanced enough to understand that maybe he's not as good as I think he is? Um, no, I think you're correct. I think over the last month, Month and a half, two months. What is it since he started starting? Oh man, it's almost three months now. I feel yeah, like. I think he's been the best guy. Now he got, uh, he does play aggressively, so maybe there's some thought there that like it has to be him or Brisson because they're both playing aggressively as a center back, right? Like he was pinched way high up on uh, Solori's goal. Right, where he Salouy's goal, yes, yeah. But I would also, yeah, but I also wondered if that was a byproduct of him having to play as a as a right it back was. in a three. Like he was out of, he wasn't in his normal position. Like he yeah. got turned in the wrong direction. And I thought if he was just playing as a two man center back, he would have been in the right position. Yeah, v vaguely speaking, when you're going up against a team that plays with a three man front line, which is what they do, you know, your three center backs in that situation have are basically man marking. So like the guy he's following is way up like that. And he goes with him. Now a veteran guy might've thought slightly differently in the sense that like, you might expect either Acosta or Quinon that should have been Acosta's side should have slid out and filled that spot. So you don't have to chase like that. That's what you would like to see happen in my mind, you know? So that's the only thing I can think of is like, if you're going to pull off, you know, one of those three guys and you kind of like the way Martinez is playing, perhaps. So I'm just trying to think of why they would pick Tafari and not Brisson. And Brisson's kind of like your captain at this point. I mean, he's wearing the armband, right? So he's like your defensive leader, theoretically. You know, that's all I can come up with. I agree with you. I, I said when they made the change, or maybe even I said that before this, I think we all did, is that there's no reason why Tafari shouldn't play, start every single game the rest of the way, right? Because he's the future, right? He's the guy that's going to yeah. be a guy no matter what. So as long as you can resign him. <laughs> so I, I don't understand it. Again, it comes back to me, like the idea that if you, that, that like there have been some goals leak, it just happened while he was playing. So if Marco's searching for the stop the goal bleeding, I can see why he, and in particularly because maybe he didn't block that shot when he could have perhaps, or tackled him or fouled him or, or shredded him or whatever. But then Brisson for me, of course, proceeds to make a couple of boneheaded mistakes and is having a bad game. So, you know, which hindsight is twenty twenty on which one you pulled off. I would have not pulled off Tafari, but you know, I I'm a big believer in that kid's game right now. Though I actually, before we go on, I want to say something interesting on set plays. Dallas has been terrible on set plays. Did you notice that Tafari wasn't man marking on set plays? They had him stand in front of Maurer as like a free agent zonal 
go get the ball and smash it out with a header or whatever kind of clearance kind of guy. He wasn't Which man he's really anybody. good at doing, by the way. He is, and it, and on this on a lot of those corners, it looked a little bit better. So that was at least one adaptation I noticed in the first half. I thought it was actually pretty good. It worked. Yeah, I I mean I I I think there is an element to Brisson's game in in terms of vocal leadership that's needed. In fact, uh, again, Steve even brought up the fact that at one point Jesus was walking back and Brisson was reading him the riot act, and and that's definitely an attitude and a level of passion that this team desperately needs. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, with Brisson, it comes with well Brisson type stuff, which then leads me to the question of well maybe Tafari should have stayed on for Martinez who I, I think as we go through the season, we all begin to look at each other and go, uh, where did the, this guy, is this, is, is he any good? And, you know, because he has moments where he's really good. Yeah. But when you think, if you go through the season and you think about all the wonky goals they've given up, how many of those has Bersan, Matt, Martinez been involved in, and then count the number that Tafari has been involved in. And I think you'd find out that Tafari has been involved in very, very few of them, and they've all been related to the other three guys, specifically Martinez. Yeah, Martinez for me, uh, I actually quite like him, um, but he's been very inconsistent. Um, And I think some of it's with a lack of a run in the team. A lack of like familiarity because there's been so much different moving pieces in the back. I think that's a part of it. The thing that Tafari has that nobody else back there has is recovery speed. Like he can, if if something happens upfield, he can get back and snuff something out, and nobody else can do that on this roster. That's one of the problems when you take him out is that there's nobody with that ability to cover up for people. Hedges used to have it. And the other day, it looked like he was getting he's getting some of it back. But this season, he hasn't really had it because of this hip problem. His injury is mm-hmm. related to that area, and that affects his recovery speed and his range, which is the term I like to use for that ability. So there's a problem there, and that's very clear when you take the fire out of the game. That's going to be a big question as we go forward because Martinez, Brisson, and Hedges are all, relatively speaking, pretty expensive. And when you're talking about a team that's going to have to do a massive rebuild, I don't buy any of this. We're like a guy or two away crap. You got to have to massively rebuild this team. So that's a lot of money and three dudes and and only one of the three probably is going to play. Yeah, I don't, I mean, that's for the next, that's next season. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, it is. I know, but I could, I I know the two that I get rid of right quickly, but we'll, we'll, we can save that for a a future. Uh, All right. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, because the first half was really bad and we talked about how it was all disconnected and people were all out of position and everybody looked like they had no effing idea what was going on. And they were probably lucky that uh, uh, Kansas city didn't score a lot of goals in that half. Um, But when the change came in the second half, it, you kind of got the sense that maybe something good was going to happen until the aforementioned incident. And I'm really interested in knowing from your point of view, how Acosta played that moment and was Brian done dirty by Marufo? Well, he definitely fouls him. I don't, you know, whether I didn't, I didn't pick up on enough, whether he got hung out to dry Acosta and he's trying to recover. I feel like if he's trying to chase down a guy, something's gone really wrong at that point in terms of tactics and like who's, who should be because like that center channel spot, there ought to be a center back there. I don't remember why well, there it was Brisson. Brisson fell over and hurt his shoulder. Oh, that's why. That's remember right. Brisson comes rushing out yeah. and he slips and falls, lands on his shoulder and is whining. You know, he's whatever. And yeah. then, and and so that leaves Acosta to right, chase right. Uh, that guy into the box. And there's a bit of a a, a kind of a a coming together of legs just outside the box. Yeah. And then right when they get to the top of the box. Brian almost tries to reach for the ball, which then puts the other guy, Shelton's legs between him and there's a tangle and he goes down. Now, I know there are a lot of people that are really angry that double jeopardy was in play there. But I'm telling yeah. you, as somebody who I feel like I have a dangerous level of understanding of how the laws of the games are applied, yeah. that is a the definition of a dog sco, and that is the double jeopardy right there. Yeah. My two in questions my, my two questions are is he in the box? When the foul initiates, and I did not think he was. It doesn't uh, make any difference. 
yeah. because it, the way the rule is written is that it, it if if a foul is initiated outside but then continues into the box, it's almost as if the referee is playing advantage mm. to allow the player into the box. Yeah. And there is additional contact inside the box. And it is yeah. a one-on-one attack with the goal. So – I, I do well, think the I do think there's some question as to where the second like did he actually foul him in the box? But that's why I think VAR was there to go back and see where Shelton was and Brian was as the as the contact continued on. And I'm just going to have to trust that he was in the box as the as, yeah. as the fouling kind of continued into the box. A hundred percent agree. It's a foul, and based on that description, yes, it's definitely a PK. My only complaint then would be. The, the red car because Mauer's there because it's not like an egregious foul. It's like a professional kind of foul. Well, so that I think that's be... where it becomes subjective. Is he legitimately yeah. trying to play the ball? Because that's the change in the double jeopardy rule is if a guy is legitimately trying to win the ball and not just take down the guy, then that's when you give a yellow card. But again, Acosta's got a bit of a reputation. Uh, he does chase him down from quite a distance. There's the original kind of contact that begins. You could go one way or the other on that aspect of it, but in the same time, it doesn't surprise me he got double jeopardy. Yeah, that's one. I can see it going either way, honestly. It's the ref in the moment is the only one that can make that call. I mean, we, can, we can argue, but I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying fans or whoever else can argue back and forth about which way it should be. It's a judgment call. You're right. It's not particularly violent. That aspect is missing, but I agree with you. I don't think he's trying to play the ball necessarily. I think he's trying to kind of bumble into the guy and get him to sort of stumble and knock him off of his you know, shot a little bit, you know. Yeah, I think I think Brian's a very smart veteran player. He knows exactly what he's doing yeah. in that moment, and I think that's why Marufo decides to give him the red card. Um, I, I, but it, it was I wasn't surprised by either one. Maybe he's slightly hard done by by the ejection, but he also put himself in that situation. So oh yeah yeah totally yeah I don't have any hard complaints about it honestly. Uh, and then suddenly now he's off. They're playing a man down. Uh, they, if there was ever a period or a uh, run of the game where Dallas actually looked like they were into it, it came after that. They actually, um, you know, Shun, Shun was on the field and he was throwing in a lot of energy. Uh, s- things changed a little bit for the team in terms of uh, some attitude. Yeah, Shun being in, I think, is a big part of that. Um, you also got a couple of guys, a couple of younger guys were by the end, a couple of younger guys are in Cerrillo's in Cervania's in guys that maybe have a little bit more. I don't Quignon know. just looks like a guy that just is like, what have I done to myself? Yeah. Well, for me, that's a different discussion, but for me, I'm, I'm actually done on Quignon. You know, he's just an average MLS player, which is mm-hmm. fine. But the, you know how I feel about the six though. For me, that's DP spot. That's Grezzo. That's, you know, from my, my boy Beckerman, that, that spot needs to be a superstar. And the guy's just whatever. I mean, is he that much better than Edwin? Uh, no. I mean, you know, so I'm I'm done on him. Cerillo and Cervania, when they come in, and probably even you could include Manjoma on this, you know, those are guys that new coach, they haven't gotten as much time as they like. Okay, maybe I got a chance to try and show something. So they had a little more pep, a little more energy, I think, than some of the guys that started did. It's also late in the game and Kansas City's winning three nothing right at that point. So it's like, you know, and they're up a man, so they're sitting back and they don't care anymore. But uh, you know, late game is so inval valueless in terms of analysis sometimes because things get all wonky with shapes and players. You know, I don't even know. Especially what, when it's three nothing. It's three nothing. I don't even know what position Majamo th- technically was playing at that point. You know, he was in for Jesus, I think, which makes him the ten. That can't be right. So. Um, it well, was at that point, Jesus of, had started playing way off on the right. Well, eventually, Jesus was subbed out, right? He came out for somebody. Yeah, but it, but because of the because they were playing down a man, he had been asked to almost play like right midfield or something, and that's where Manjoma ended up playing when he came in for for Jesus. They must have moved two Mwasi inside then in the Acosta spot, kind of. Anyway, whatever. That's what I mean by it being a mess late game. You know, all you can look for there is really spirit and, and you know, guys that are trying to show or trying to do something. You know, they did get a goal. Pepe got a goal. That's great. Always love to see that. You know, did you think he was offside when it when it no. first happened in real time? No, uh-uh. the first one I did, but this one I didn't. Oh, I see, I, when it first happened in real time, I thought for sure he was offside. I was somewhat surprised at the angle that they showed in the replay uh, that made him look. Com- 
clearly onside because it was so different from the uh, original angle in real time. But yeah, whatever. The, I'm glad he scored it and it was a nice finish and I'm glad Pepe got back on the board. We'll talk the guy about that was Pepe playing in a center, second. Yeah, the guy that was playing center back at that point because there were two guys up on Hollingshead and they both boned it and Hollingshead was free. He had tried to adjust to get out there and he left Pepe by himself. So Pepe was, you know, uh, slow playing that run because he's now, the nearest defender is now like 10 yards behind him. And all he has to have Ryan do is flip it over the top and he's in, you know, because that guy was caught halfway between Ryan and him. You know, the player there probably should have been from the center back was to stay with Pepe longer and make Ryan carry it all the way forward and then try and see if you can get some help before you go out there. So poor reaction by the defense on, by on Kansas city's part, but a nice ball by Ryan too. You know, I, it's nice to have Ryan back. Look, the guy has some deficiencies, no question. He's been a little inconsistent this year, but you can see what he brings to the table in terms of even rusty, you know, he brought in a, a, a parts of the game that has been missing from that left back spot. Even though I just said Emma earlier has done well, he's not Ryan. Well, Emma on the left was kind of a good performance, really poor performance in Houston, and then kind of a recovery performance on the left. But he was really, I thought he was one of the better players last night um, yeah, uh, on the right. He's definitely more, he he's like Ryan uh, is on the left. You know, when he's playing in his natural side, he's really into it. But when you stick him on the wrong side of the field, you can see he really struggles with that in the same way Ryan does playing on the right. So Now, just not to go totally back to the Houston sense. game, but the two goals, the, the, the stuff that came from his side, he did not have any help defense from the wing, and he was right. reacting to somebody else's lack of coverage. So that's why he was stretched in the Houston game. It wasn't his fault. Because I think ema has been amazing, and I don't want to undersell that. So, with the loss, as we said at the beginning, September is winless for FC Dallas. That's Jesus. pretty uh, brutal. It also takes the team back down below the Mendoza line of less than one point per game. Uh, and it also, as well documented by the original Burn fan, El Jefe, uh, on Buzz's Discord, has uh, noted for everybody, clearly put the club on its pace to be the second worst points per game season for the club and to actually best it to not be the second worst season points per game in the history of FC Dallas and the Dallas burn. They will have to get 13 points in their last six matches, which lines up like this home against Minnesota uh, away. Uh, no home against LAFC. Then they fly out to LA to play the galaxy, come home to play real salt Lake at home then they go down to Austin to play North Austin, and then they finish the season at San Jose. And yeah. uh, as Dustin says, tell me where they're going to get 13 points out of that. Mm. Yeah, now, th this is about the home field, right? So it's like four of six at home. So if they're going to get 13, it's going to have to turn back into like awesome home form. Uh, this team doesn't look like any signs of awesome home form are happening. Um, you know you what? Remember... You know what, Buzz? I, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you, but I, but to to drive on that point, if we had any signs from these two previous games, or even dating back prior to Lucci getting shit canned, that there was any sort of real momentum for this team getting better, like some of the vibe we were getting when they went on that really nice run, um, uh, or kind of in the summer that we were all surprised by, where they tied Seattle and beat Kansas City, and they really did. That was the vibe where we're like, mm, maybe there is something here, and then it all kind of evaporated. That, to me, is why this season is just done and dusted at this point. Yeah, do you remember way back when we first started talking about the brutality of the schedule when they had six of seven on the road coming up, and I was like, and we said, man, they're going to get to the end of September with one more win than they have now. Well, they got here, and they have two more. And it's because they had those couple of good surprising road results that got them. They have, they have, I think they have one more win and one more tie than I predicted they would. And so yeah. they're, they're barely a couple of points better than that, that mark. The team ended up exactly where we thought they were going to end up. And that's down at the bottom of the standings, you know, Hey, still best in Texas. Woo -woo. <laughs> for well, I don't, for how much, much longer though? I mean, Houston yeah. got a point last night. Did. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're going to find out. Look, home field matters, man. We're going to find out whether this team has any heart left. Plus, Peppy Watch will be fun. So, Yeah, right let's down. talk about that a little bit. You were uh, commenting on that on social media uh, a little while ago. So with his goal last night, Peppy is now on 13 goals for the season. And that's a, that's a notable uh, uh, achievement on his part because that now rockets him to fifth. 
Uh, tied for fifth all time in best and most goals scored in a season with Carlos Ruiz from uh, 2006 and Kreiss from his 2002 and original 1996 seasons. Puts him two behind the great Ariel Graziani. What's that guy doing these days? Who had 15 in 2000. And then now, just to refresh everybody's memories, the most goals scored in a season was 18, which is tied between Kenny Cooper and Jason Kreiss in 2008 and 1999. And Jeff Cunningham in 2009 was 17. But here's the thing. I had totally forgotten this, Buzz. Yeah. Of... The top two, uh, two of the top three uh, records, the 18 and 17, two of those come in seasons the club did not qualify for the playoffs. Yeah. The 2008 and nine seasons where they had uh, the 18 goals by Kenny and the 17 by Jeff in 2009, they did not qualify for the playoffs those those years. Yeah, defense matters. Well, first, shout out to Pepe because he's done the 13 in less games than everybody else, which is why he's on top of that grouping. Um, and he now has got a chance to do something truly remarkable in terms of just goal scores. But as you say, just scoring goals doesn't get you in the playoffs. You have to play a complete game. It's the goal difference. It's not just goals for or goals against. It's goal difference. You have to be able to produce the, some of the best teams in history have hardly scored any goals. The 2010 team, for example, mm-hmm. hardly, they had like 20 goals or something. They never scored. They had 14 ties, I think it was that year. I say that without actually looking up the number. So... You know, not always is it just going to be about goals, but it'll be fun to watch this 18 year old kid with six games to play. How many can he get? You know, because there's a, a, and and there's also a three game span for the national team coming up, too. Yeah. Well, and there's an international window. So there's not like he's going to, and so he might not miss any games as far as I know. We'll have to see how much he plays. So he might be back in time to play all six of them for Dallas. I mean, it's going to be fun. Uh, by the way, the answer to the, the what's Errol Graziani doing? Last time I Googled him, he was mayor of like this tiny little 3,000 person town where he was from in Argentina or something like that. <laughs> it's like, if you wonder where he went, he's uh, probably playing in an Argentinian beer league, just yeah, crushing the numbers. Him, yeah, crushing him in. He's got yeah. a beer gut and everything. Well, fun example, by the way, because in, in my estimation, in the history of FC Dallas Strikers, Ariel Graziani stylistically is the most similar player to Pepe in the way they play. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I think you know what I yeah. hadn't thought. You know, Graziani had that weird kind of body language when he ran. Yeah, and and Pepe kind of has that going on too. A little bit, and he plays yeah. a little bit over the top. He can post up a little bit. He's yeah, a poacher yeah. in the box like Graziani. Very similar player. Like Jesus is Christ, and Pepe is Graziani. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good comparison. Yeah, so yeah. play a formation that fits that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that hard. <laughs> Declares Buzz Carrick yeah. on his podcast. <laughs> Not that hard. Yeah, pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, let's talk, before we move on to the thing I really want to talk about, I do want to ask you about Jesus who did not have his best performance last night. Steve and Mark openly wondered if that was some sort of reaction to not getting the call up with the national team. I'm not sure Jesus has played his best. You know, Jesus has had this kind of up and down on and off season, but he clearly had a run of games there uh, where he was really showing off and we were all feeling really good for him. And then it all just kind of, uh, as as the team goes, he goes a little bit and he's kind of fallen off a little bit. Well, you know, Marco or uh, not Marco, Mark or Steve would have talked to him more recently than I have. So I, I definitely think that the first time he didn't get called up, that it lit a fire in him because that's when he had that run of like five games where he pretty much carried the team. He was our best player through that stretch. I think he was my man of the match four out of five games. And in the last couple, probably since, as you're right, since he found out he didn't get called in again, you know, maybe there is a negativity. And now it's like he was like, I'm killing it and I'm not getting called in. My boy Lucci's gone because believe me, he's Lucci's boy. So, oh, yeah. you know, at least from Lucci's point of view, he was. So I don't know what Jesus thinks about Lucci, but Lucci loves him and some Jesus. Well, I, I did, I did, I did want to ask you: Did you notice that when he got subbed off last night? Did you see he just walked right past Feruzzi and there was mm. no interaction between the two of them whatsoever? Now I may be reading into it. It felt a wee bit chilly, but again, I will be admit that I'm speculating and reading into it. But that didn't seem like, hey, good game, good effort, nice try. It was, I ain't speaking to you, dude. Well, without looking at Jesus' stats, how many times do you remember Jesus getting pulled off by Lucci? 
almost never. Yeah. Lucci oh, yeah. always left him on forever. So he's probably not he's not used to that for sure. He's a young guy. He has been killing it of late. He probably figures I'm the only one that's got a shot to score here. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised he's upset. He is still a very young man. There's, you know, there's a maturity factor there as well. You know, so it doesn't surprise me that he sort of had that reaction. Fruzzi is a much older guy than, than Lucci is, at least in my mind he is. You know, so I'm, I, it doesn't surprise me at all. I did not notice it, but mm-hmm. a lot of times I, in the heat of the moment, I take a lot of that stuff for not a big deal, unless, of course, the coach grabs the guy and all of a sudden there's finger pointing and stuff. And then it's oh, a big deal. Oh, you mean like. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to, you know, good on Marco to just let him walk by. Sometimes you got to recognize the player is pissed and just let him go. Yeah. You know, don't force the moment like Lucci did. That was a big learning moment for Lucci. I doubt he'll do that again, you know. By the way, did you notice how hot everybody is for Lucci now? Like the longer Dallas continues to still suck, people like it. Obviously, it wasn't Lucci, and so now his name's coming up for like Chicago and other places. Thought that was funny. Well, do you, do you think do you think that Lucci will legitimately get hired for another MLS head coaching gig next? I, I don't. I don't. No, I, think, I don't either. I think he'll get a pro assistant job next. I mean, if I was a fan of a of an MLS club and found out they hired Lucci Gonzalez to be my next manager, I would be pissed. Well, he's still and I don't mean that as disrespectful to Lucci, but come on. Yeah, somebody will probably try and make him an academy director, which is fine. But if it, Lucy wants to progress his career, the thing he's missing is some pro experience. So he needs to take a job as an assistant for an MLS team or maybe be a head coach in USL championship. That yeah. Somebody in championship might grab him as a head coach for sure. Um, you know, Or an assistant Miami. on somebody else's... Yeah, like whoever he's got a mentor, like whoever's got a relationship sort, maybe go be an Oscar assistant if Oscar needs an assistant for some reason. You know, something like that. Someone he has a relationship with. Because, you know, he could... Lucci's... Look, I think Lucci has a lot of potential as a coach. We said that when yeah, he got hired in the first place. I agree. He needs seasoning. He needs experience. He needs to go be an assistant for somebody in the pro game or run a USL championship team. That'd be fine too. You know, get some of that experience. Get some of that. See some things. Get a little older. Interact with pros more. You know, not kids so much. You know, uh, but then, no, I'd be surprised if he gets an MLS job really quickly. Uh, that would, that would, head job, that would, that would shock me. Yeah. All right. Let's get into this subject uh, that I am, uh, it's growing more and more of a concern for me. And it was, it was highlighted last night, which is the uh, current fate of my hero on this team, my favorite player and the one that I want the most good for, which is one Paxton Pomacall. Who got subbed out at the 63rd minute against Vancouver. He didn't start last night. I think they tried to sub him on with like five minutes left. But because uh, Kansas City was playing keep away. I don't think he got on until I think maybe literally the 90th minute of the game. Um, And I've really become concerned, Buzz, about, you know, Paxton's career in Dallas. Because as we've watched him over the last several months now, we all knew what we were getting when this started, that playing him out on the wing was a bit of a, uh, was was kind of couched under the idea of, hey, we really want to protect him um, and let him play in a position where maybe he's not going to get knocked around as much, plus he's not game fit and he's coming back from his injury. But I think, would you agree with me, Buzz, just to start off this conversation, that playing on the wing has noticeably diminished the overall game of Pomacall. No. You don't think so? No. So you you think that the same assertive, game-changing qualities that he was bringing when he was playing in the center of the park are still evident in his game out on the wing? No, but I don't think it's because he's playing on the wing. I think it's because the season is a disaster and he's – for much of it, been in not great physical. Look, he always says he feels great. Clearly, he does not feel great. Every time he hits the ground, he does not bounce back up like he used to. Do you remember what I, at the beginning of the season, how many games I said if he started, it would be considered a massive success? It was 15, you remember? Mm -hmm. He's sitting on 13. Okay. So he's right where he needs to be. He was in horrific shape at the start of the year in terms of his body and how much discomfort he was in. That's why his game is not what it was because of the the banging and the damage. Now, he will say he feels awesome. He's in the best shape of his life. He always says that. He's clearly not. The amount of time it takes him to get up off of these bangings and slammings to the ground 
is is clearly he's not. I saw I watch him in training. He clearly is hurting still some. Mm-hmm. Now maybe it's reaggravations. Maybe it's new injuries. Maybe he'll say the old injury is fine. Uh, I'm sure that he will. I do not see the same player physically in terms of like to me he he play he acts a little bit like he's old. Except of course he's not. You know, so that's what, in my mind, that's what the problem is. That, and combined with the bad season, combined with the fact that he's annoyed he's not playing in the middle, it's not the actual playing on the wing that's hurting him. It's all those other things. You know, Paxson, here's the thing, Peter. Paxson has only played, started 37 games here in his entire career. In six years, 37 games. That's barely a season of starts. You know, it's it, he just... Physically, he has not been able to stay in the lineup enough to be consistent and be impactful. Now, listen, I, I want him to be in the middle, too. Everybody wants him to be in the middle. I think there'll be a point where he is in the middle. Right now, totally fine. He's on the wing. It's not the wing that's the problem. All right. I'm going to disagree with you on at least one aspect of this. Um, I, 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 My concern is, is that he needs to be in the middle, and he needs to start being in the middle now. Because especially on a season that's lost – like you say with other players, why not see what we got? And I and and um, my feeling is my concern with Paxton is there is no clear path to him returning to this team as a starting center midfielder. And I think it, the waters become even more muddy when we don't know what the coaching situation is going to be. Yeah, be, you know, and and I do wonder. And this is going to sound like. Um, blasphemy and i'm going to be called a heretic for saying this uh but i do wonder if i was on paxton's team uh, his you know his personal management crew if i wouldn't be asking the question maybe i should find my career somewhere else other than dallas yeah what, what i would say about that is that if they were ready to put Paxton in the middle for these last six games i would be ecstatic by that i would love that but this is it comes back to this disingenuous in my opinion idea that like you're playing to win these six games. And so I totally understand why right now, if I want to win these six games, Paxton at eight isn't the answer because well, I, we just spent a whole bunch of the show early on talking about how you can't radically change things overnight as a coach in soccer. It just doesn't happen. It, has, it, t- it takes time to make pe- people play different ways and change the systems. They're, they're most of the way through a season. It's hard to get that going the other way right this minute. But yet, if they wanted to try, I 100% would be on board with it. The other thing is, I would say, if I'm on Paxton's team, and listen, I don't know anybody on Paxton's team, but if I was, I wouldn't say, I'm not ready to say, is my future in Dallas or not yet? But I would 100% be in there asking questions of the owner and the technical director. Is my future in the middle? Are you going to play me where I should be playing or not? Because the answer to that question then becomes like, you know, because just to just sit here and say, like, I don't see a path forward. Oh, I do. I see a real clear path forward. What is that path? I'm interested in hearing what you think that is. How does he become the eight on this team with Brian Acosta and and Cervania and Sari? Like all these other guys, they've got clogged up in the middle. Well, he's better than Cervania and Cyril, right? We agree? I, in theory, yes. We haven't not seen him play in the middle in so long. I don't know anymore, right? Oh, That's I, the I, other part of this question. He plays in the middle all the time in training. Okay. You know, like just because he doesn't play in the middle of the game doesn't mean he doesn't do it. He plays like anytime he's not the starting wing in training, he's almost always more of an eight with the other group than he is a wing. Maybe, maybe three quarters of the time when he's not the starter, he's the other side. And I just told you, start back and doesn't start very much. So Mm -hmm. um, the other side of that coin is Brian Acosta. As far as I know, Brian Acosta's contract is going to be up at the end of this season. Now they may have some options, but let me ask you this. If you have a DP, and you only have two, and one of them sucks, and the other guy's just okay. Do you bring back Brian Acosta? Well, I mean, is he what? playing good enough to be the, the focal point of your franchise? He's not now. At the yeah. beginning of the season, he was playing lights out, and I was like, oh, that's actually kind of uh, borderline DP performances we're expecting out of the guy. But I also think that Brian is uh, one of those types of guys that kind of reads the writing on the wall and goes, uh, yeah, this whole team's not very good, so I'm just going to I'm just gonna go as the team goes. So, right, one of the things I say, I, I don't want to get into this too much because it's part of the offseason plan kind of discussion, but, you know, one of the things, the way you manage rosters is that you you bring in DPs at the spine, right? Center back, 
six, eight, ten, nine, right? Mm-hmm. Those key guys right up the middle. Maybe wing, but that's if you're a luxury team, right? So Dallas has one of the nine who stinks, and you're stuck with next year anyway. One of the things I always say about DPs, and I don't know if Dan Hunt would agree with me. I don't know if Zana would agree with me. I don't think those guys know MLS well enough to know. Marco might agree with me. I'm not sure. If you have an American, a domestic player, that can do a job at a high level, don't sign a DP in the same position. So it's pretty simple to me. Like I, to, for me, to, for when you say that, like there's no path forward for Paxson. I think Paxson Pomacal at the eight is the future of this franchise. I, I don't do think. I don't think Brian Acosta at the eight. Brian Acosta is now what 28, 29. I don't think Brian Acosta as a DP eight is the future of this franchise. So I don't think there's this urgency. I don't think there should be. I have no idea if he does it or not. For for Paxson Pomacal to get out of here, I think it should be like, okay, dude, it's time. Give me the yeah. reins. You know, um, I think my answer to all of that is is if if the club ever really intended to play him in the middle, we would have seen it a lot more than we did by now. And this even predates back to prior to the injury when you and I and Dan were confused over why Jesus was being asked to play a position that wasn't his position to play. Really, that was being you know kind of that deep more like deep line 10 or an eight. We're like, why is he not playing Paxton there? That's really his position. Why is he forcing Jesus in there? And it's because, well, because Jesus is his guy. That's who he loves. He yeah. loves Jesus, right? Yeah. Everything Jesus. And, and, and that just, and that makes me nervous for Paxton. If, uh, you know, maybe if Quill becomes the coach, maybe Quill sees it differently. Clearly Feruzzi doesn't see it differently because he's not playing him as an eight. Uh, well, right now and maybe he will over the next few games and i do wonder if a south american coach comes up through the zanata process is he gonna play paxton as an eight i, yeah. I don't know I, well, I have my doubts that's the that's the difference between marco long term and marco being told he has to win three games i mean i don't know if Paxton in the middle gets you three games right now but let me let's not get caught up in that um if you assume for a minute that you have if you get a guy from south america you have no clue what he's going to want right then this is my kind of point with like, I wouldn't be asking out like this minute. It's like, see what happens over the next few months. Oh, Talk sure. to the French yeah. franchise. But like, if you bring in Quill, Quill remembers when Paxton was an eight in the Academy. That's what he mostly played. In the Academy was eight, right? What if it's, what if let's say just hypothetically Tab Ramos or one of Tab's assistants just as a craziness had this FC Dallas job. Well, he used Paxton as an eight with the national yep. team, the U20 team, right? What if Oscar comes back? Oscar loves Paxton as an eight. That's where he thinks Paxton's future is, right? Stop it, Buzz. Stop it, Buzz. The, That's not fair. That's how about teasy. the Bazan That's brothers? Teasy. One of the Bazan brothers once time, what, what was I was talking to him when we were watching Jesus, Paxton, Brandon play midfield. He was like, man, in three years, this midfield is going to be amazing. They like him as an eight. I'm just saying that like there's lots of coaching candidates out there. Most everybody thinks Paxton Pomacall is going to be an amazing eight. Nobody talks about Paxton Pomacall being a wing. It's just a short-term stopgap because the kid's 21 and he can't stay on the field for more than five minutes over six years. I'm not saying like so to like to force your way out now. I think it's a bad play. I think you got to see what happens, see if there's a new coach, get some assurances from the franchise. And if they're like, yeah. "Well, we're not really sure," well, then screw them at that point and they go get me out. Okay. Of here. Well, then you and I are on closer uh, closer in agreement than I think you, we thought we were because I, I yeah. If I said it as if they should be on the doorstep of Dan Hunt right now, banging on his door saying, "Play me the Miller, I quit forever." That's not what I'm saying. I do certainly think you have to read the room and see how things go. But when I say I don't see a path. I'm worried that the people that I think ultimately will end up getting this job aren't the kind of guys that will end up putting Pax at the eight. And eventually he's going to have to make a decision to go someplace else to play at the position that is going to maximize his career. That's yeah. what I'm concerned about. No, I, I think that's entirely possible, but I definitely see a pathway for it because I think it's time for Acosta to go. I think Ricarte is obviously not a success. I think Jesus, because Pepe's going to be gone, Jesus might be a nine next year. You know, I mean, there's, I, I definitely think that. Again, we're, this is getting into a lot of what I was going to talk about this winter. Is like I agree with you. It's time for Paxson to have the keys to the bus. It's time, you know, if he can stay healthy. So that's where I am with him. All right. So just to kind of put a bow on this, at least for the time being, do you think he should be playing as the eight for the rest of this particular season? No. Okay. No, because it's too short of a window. Even to be fair to him, like to ask him to shift tactically and carry all that weight. 
this late in a bad season, you know, it, a, a lot of Paxton for me right now is protecting Paxton from himself. Get through this season with, with him, holding him together. Don't let him, because you know how Paxton is. If you put him in right there in there right now, he's going to try and do it all, and he's going <laughs> to destroy himself. You know what I mean? That's like 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 if you look back at my prediction, I I predicted flat out that he would not start this game because they played the last game on turf. You get three games in a week. Sit him. Don't let him get in out there. Protect the kid from himself. That's where I am on this season. 15 starts is what I told you at the beginning of the year. I wanted Paxton to get. He's at 13. So yeah. we're right on pace. If he, if he starts all six, I don't remember how many of them are midweek games, but if they're all on the weekend, he gets to the last six. I'm okay with that. You know, one more game off, that's fine too. You know, even two games off after this would be fine too. Give him four or six, great. But keep him out on the wing. Don't let him get hurt. You know what I mean? Just get through the year. And without having another major injury happen, keep using him, keep playing him because he's important, but don't go crazy with the kid. Speaking of coaches playing for their job, let's take a look at Eric Quill and North Texas Soccer Club. What's up with those cats? Yeah, well, they're starting to get things going in the right direction. The defense is getting a little solidified. Uh, they still don't have a real great six, but uh, Quill's making do. He's made some adjustments in terms of fitness to try and stop the in-game wilting. And already, even just like well, over two weeks, they're starting to see some results in that. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit big picture about him because I think it's important. As much as we've talked about Marco and his chance to play for this job, I think Quill also is coaching this team right now for this job in a lot of ways, because you can look back at his, his background now, right? Also an Academy guy in the past, which the club likes, right? Mm -hmm. He won the championship in the first season, you know, with the back and forth players coming up and down, using the Academy, bringing guys up. By the time they got to the championship, both outside backs were Academy kids starting, right? So, and Pepe was Pepe and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So he's doing exactly the model the franchise wants. He wins coach of the year. He wins the title. 2020 happens and COVID. So now he no longer gets the MLS train coming down. He no longer gets those guys because nobody has antibodies. He no longer gets the academy because nobody's got antibodies. He manages to coach that team up over the course of the season, gets him to third and almost gets that to second. Like on the last day, there's a tie instead of a win by somebody. I can't remember who it was. And if they hadn't shortened the playoffs to just a single game, instead of four teams getting in, they made it just two, then he would have been in the playoffs again a second time. So now this season, again, beginning of the year, doesn't have a lot of the MLS guys coming down at first, doesn't have a lot of the academy kids coming up at first because of the whole COVID antibodies. He's getting more of those things now. He's getting his defense straightened out. He's jumped some guys. He's signed some new guys. They're back into the playoffs. They're back in sixth place. They've got a pretty good streak going they had like they went nine games without losing they didn't have a lot of wins in there but they didn't have any losses either and then then they dropped a couple but now they've done some more things again so if you don't want to talk about a guy who is vocal and demanding and is is uh experienced in the hunt way that this is the way academy to north texas to fc dallas he gets all that he's used to dealing with that operation he's now dealt with pros for three seasons he has an academy background I just think that, like, if you if you if you think about the hunts and their in-house setup, their tendency to go in-house, Marco for sure coaching to get a job, Quill for sure coaching to get a job. If he can show some things here back into this season, he's going to put himself right in there with Marco. And if both of those guys were to stumble, then you look at guys that may be a little further out of the organization. Look, many candidates we've talked about, and of course, the giant X factor is Zanata. But I think Quill has a shot to put himself in and maybe even jump ahead of Marco, depending on how good it goes for him, just as how good it's going to go for Marco or not. So it'll be fun to watch both of those guys because and the hunt tendency to hire their guys, those are the two guys, even more than Chewy and Lucene are. Those are the two, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it'll be fascinating to watch North Texas if you're interested in the future of this franchise because even if they don't hire Quill for the, ML the FC Dallas job, Quill's not leaving North Texas unless somebody else calls from MLS or something. So um, he's going to be here, I think, probably no matter what. But uh, it'll be fun to watch, and, and I think he's probably an out outstanding candidate for all the hunt factors that are in play. And earlier this week, you uh, broke the story that in the FC Dallas Academy circles, there had been some incidences. Now the third across two of the teams where players on FC Dallas were called 
uh, racist slurs were used against them yeah. versus other MLS Next teams. The most recent came against, uh, uh, I guess it was the U15s against the Colorado Rapids. Right. So when this team was a U14 team, they had an incident with Real Colorado. That was back in May. And then the team that's one year older, the 2006s, they had a problem in the playoffs of the end of last season, which is the, kind of this summer against San Jose. And then this is, and it was after that, that Alex Aldez, who's the coach of this U 15s, um, both then and now the U 15 coach, the, the coaches stay place and the teams move up. Uh, for me, he's the best coach left in the Academy. I, I think, I think so highly of the guy he instructed his players. If it happened again, to walk off the field. And so they did against Colorado Rapids. They walked off the field. There's been some tweets that, the call the kid got red carded and then he had to come apologize to Dallas or whatever. I don't know any of the real details other than what is technically hearsay in that sense, but they walked off the field. So credit to FC Dallas as an organization, a for doing it in the first place. And at the same time it happened, the U 14 team, which is coached by Scott James, he pulled his team off in support and FC Dallas is supporting both of those coaches and those teams for doing so. 100% backing, they said. There is a process by which these things are reviewed in the MLS Next system. I have no clue where they are in the process other than I'm told there is a process and it is in it for whatever that's worth. So will something happen? I don't know. You know, they, they do a lot of talk, MLS does, about these zero tolerance policies, but I don't know that anything really is going to happen with kids. You know, we'll see. I do think it's kind of interesting that that particular FC Dallas team, which has had two of the three incidences, uh, has a whole lot of Latino kids and a whole lot of um, black kids. We'll say black these days, right? I'm not going to get in trouble. Um <laughs> It's not African American anymore, right? That's what I'm saying. I'm not. Just don't say Negro. Yeah, don't say Negro like the Austin guy, podcast. Right. Um, right. The point being is that there's there's and there's a couple and there's some white guys too. It's a very mixed interracial mixed team. It's not a lily white team. It's not an all Latino team. All the FC Dallas teams up and down the academy have a lot of different racial uh, qualities to them. They're not uniform one way or the other. And it's interesting to me that this particular team seems to, and in the, in the age group right above it, which are very mixed, lots of different things happening. Like they seem to be drawing the ire somehow of, of kids that I don't know anything about the other teams at all, but they're both Colorado teams that have had this problem and one team from San Jose. And it just, you know, it's not a great thing to be seeing with happening in MLS next I think they should do something about it. What I have no idea what that thing is, but there needs to be a fix here. Yeah, for one team to have had to have a one, basically one team. The kids within one year of each other happened three times now. I, it is. The, I think the you know kids calling other kids names isn't shocking to me because that's what that's what t young teenagers do. They try to say the most shocking thing possible. Um, that happens a lot. Uh, and in this case, it's the, you know, uh, in our culture today, the worst possible thing to get. I think what I find more troublesome than anything else is how the league or the people running the league are handling it. And the idea that the first incident, which happened how long ago? May. Yeah. It's still, under still hasn't been settled. Like the yeah. fact that it's still under investigation makes no sense to me. And that's where the parents and the adults in the room are really failing the kids. Um, and that, that's where that whole thing needs to get cleared up because clearly if some yeah. kid does that, the hammer needs to come down. The kid needs to get kicked out, learn his life lesson, lose his opportunity and give it to somebody that's not stupid enough to do that. Even at the age of 13 or 14. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, you know, it never surprises me when the adults, uh, screw these things up. Yeah. MLS next launched in the middle of the pandemic. It is a very, very, very small group of people that run that thing. It does not shock me at all that it's now months and months and months later and nothing has really happened and it's still quote under investigation. I'm not saying that that's correct. It should not be that way, but they don't have, you know, the whole thing is on a shoestring with literally like five people as soon as I can tell run it. So it's not, it, they, there's definitely a organizational problem here, which is really the reason I, I thought we should talk about it because there's definitely a big picture problem with how they're, they're dealing with these things that there's now been three incidences with nothing happening to the same organization, no, same on the receiving end, same organization that there's not been, 
you know, they, they put out some memo that there was going to, after the second one, I think it was, that there was going to be some, you know, shutdown on, on zero tolerance policy and all that kind of stuff. And here we are again. And, you know, granted, it's less than a week later, but um, it's not a good look and it's not good to have this happen to any of the Dallas kids. Those kids are all a tremendous talents. Those are some really good teams. I don't know them personally, but I cannot imagine that it's a fun thing to have happen. And credit to them for having the guts because the kids initiated, the kids just walked off and the coach was like, yeah, what? Oh yeah, let's go get off. You know, if you hear it, let's go, you know? So they did. And the other team walked off too in protest. So good on them for the other FC Dallas team, other FC Dallas team, the U14 team walked off in support. All right. Well, keep us posted on that buzz. Um, all right. Anything else? Uh, we miss Dan. Where's, where's is Dan like traversing the country? Is he on a birthday vacation? Is that what yeah. this is? It's a week plus long birthday. You know, he's 21 today. You can finally legally drink. And then, uh, no, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's on a birthday trip through Colorado and Arizona and, and all kinds of places. All right. So I'm jealous. It's what I like to do. We, we miss you, Dan Crook. Hey, I don't mean to bring the room down, but while we were recording this on uh, Thursday evening, I just happened to look up a note. This one uh, blows me away, Buzz, and I think it will you too. The Texas Rangers have announced the passing and death of John Zonk Lazillo Jr. Zonk, the greatest fan in Texas Ranger history. Uh, baseball's version of uh, Crazy George died today at the age of 88. Buzz, I've probably been to maybe five, six Ranger games in my life, but uh, as a longtime Dallas, I mean, I've lived in Dallas since I was the one or two years old. Zonk is very much on my landscape, and to see that he has passed away uh, is really, really sad, and it should be for anybody that's lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for a long time and is a fan of the sport. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a baseball fan by any means, but I know who you're talking about. And certainly when you have a fan that's that iconic passing, it, it's, a, it's you know, a, a, a blow to the organization in the sense of a guy that was in some ways a face of their fan base and to a certain extent, you know, probably yeah, completely fair. Sure. But, but, you know, an iconic when, when guys that are around organizations, even if they're not officially part of the organizations, when they pass, it's like you can't help as an organization be affected by that, you know, and and. The Rangers have enough problems as it is they, without piling on with that kind of thing. And so it's bad. It's <laughs> terrible to see. And, and I mean, it is a cycle of life and all that, but um, still a loss for that organization, even if he's not an employee. Yeah. And I feel like it's oddly weird that he passed away after they lost their 100th game of a season. That's really sad. Well, maybe he was holding on for the end of the season. <laughs> maybe he was. I'll never yeah. forget going to a Ranger game, and I was a little tiny kid, and I remember hearing the drum. He used to hold that tambourine yeah. drum and hit it with a drumstick, and I and I was I was clearly affected by seeing one human being in a crowd of, I don't know what it was at the time, 20,000, 30,000 people, singularly change the atmosphere of a baseball game. Uh, just by himself, I I'll never forget that, and uh, and I'm not a baseball fan in any way, shape, or form, but I am a fan of Zonk. So, uh, R.I.P. Zonk. Yeah, I feel like I remember being there when it was him and 200 people, and he he still yeah, was up there doing his exactly. thing with that drum. Yeah, exactly. In the old Arlington Stadium, even remember those oh, yeah. days? Well, yeah, no, of course I do. I used to sit in the bleachers for two dollars at Arlington Stadium. <laughs> I grew up there. Remember, like two yep. miles from the ballpark. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. That's your that's your hometown, not yeah. mine. Yeah, for, for sure. All right, Buzz. Well, thank you uh, for all the bummer talk that we had to do on this particular episode. That's we, it was feeling. Uh, there just seemed to be a stretch. We were having so much fun and talking about hopeful things and thinking things were going to go okay, but in the last few weeks, it's all gone to shit. Well, we try and keep it level headed. We try and keep it analytical in the context well, of the moment, and I do. And so, <laughs> there's plenty to chew on here. You know, with the coaching change and like, can you affect it? Can you not? And and what's going on with the organization? I mean, this it's a fascinating time to be covering this team when you know you're trying to see multiple guys angling for the job, you know, and trying to line it up. That's the funny thing is like, as as crap as some people might think this job is, it's still one of the 30 MLS jobs, 27 MLS jobs in the not in the world or in America, and people want this gig. You know, as bad yeah. as it is, people want it, so it's gonna be fun. And I'm sure on that list of people that wanted it will be people with European and Champions League experience uh, that we chose not to hire. I can't think of for any. For whatever reason that would be. Oh, Alvarez. 
<laughs> Good point. Yeah. All right, so Minnesota this weekend. We'll talk more about the details of that game here later on, but what do you think will happen in terms of lineup? Well, the fascinating thing will be the, the return of Matt Hedges from one game yellow card suspension. So then you then you get into questions. I mean, clearly the four, back four is the way to go. From Frizzy's a back four guy anyway. Duh. Duh. So uh, Pepe will not have left yet. It's my understanding. So Pepe and Jesus are obvious. Paxton back was be, will be good. I want to see Obreon sit and have Paxton and Shun. Whether that happens or not, uh, Obreon obviously can be in that mix with those three guys uh, for some reason it seems like marco's not super high on shun uh which i don't understand uh it seems likely that acosta is out so it's faco and so you're gonna need an eight kind of player I, it won't be paxton i'm telling you probably brandon Servania. i know this sounds a lot like what we're doing on Lucci. uh ryan's back at <laughs> left does. back i I'm know so it does confused <laughs> ima tomasi at right back i don't think manjoma is going to get a shot there mauer and goal so really the question is hedges is back do you like do you do you like tafari uh, a brisson looked like crap so hopefully not him you know i i want to see tafari martinez but probably more likely it'll be uh hedges and somebody hedges and martinez or hedges and tafari or hedges and brisson so which one of those combos you like you know is up to you put your money on the table but that's what I see happening. And lest us not forget that Third Degree, the podcast, is brought to you by Soccer 90. Now, Soccer90.com is, as always, your singular source for things like FC Dallas shirts, U.S. national team gear, and any kind of gear from any kind of club or national team from around the globe. That's where you go to get it. And in fact, new arrivals have been showing up, including the new third jersey from PSG. And I think you can even get Messi's name on the back as well. It is the Hall of Fame weekend coming up this weekend, the FC Dallas match. And as I said, the Willie Nelson concert. So if you're going, get there early because the store itself, the brick and mortar store, which you may not have been in, is open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So stop by, grab your gear before the game and carry it around in a bag and uh, show it off to all your friends. And if you buy on the website, don't forget, you third degree listeners get 25% off your order. Just use the code third degree at checkout at soccer90.com. All right, Buzz, thank you. Don't forget Minnesota, the Loons, one of the best brands in the league, come to town uh, Saturday night. It starts at 7 p.m., but don't forget, this is the big, giantly super hyped Hall of Fame induction weekend. Uh, people getting inducted into the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame, which for those of you unfamiliar, is actually yeah. located at Toyota Stadium. Um, and uh, that will be going on all day. There's all kinds of things happening. The game will be on TXA 21, but don't forget, if you buy a ticket, you also get to go to the Willie Nelson Rock and Roll Country Show afterwards. And there are also fireworks involved with that so it's one of the biggest events in the uh, club's docket for the season and they're going to make a big deal out of it and hopefully the guys can get three points to go along with all the willie nelson stuff and pot smoke that certainly will be there at the same time all right buzz thanks again man i appreciate it you're welcome shout out to the columbus crew for winning the Champions cup and support yeah. us on patreon if you will yeah do both of those things shout out to columbus and Give Buzz some of your dollars, please. Why don't you do that? All right. Thank you, FC Dallas Curious Fan. We'll speak to you in a week's time, hopefully with some points in our hand uh, on another edition of Third Degree, the podcast. Happy birthday, Dan. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree. Green Air Podcast.